Um, so maybe I should uh, start by introducing uh, uh, Ken and uh, Alessandro and Pascal. So, um, so I'll start with uh, Ken. Uh, so Boris here uh, introduced us to Ken um, Kinder, who created Cadence Spectre Circuit Simulator and the Velo Gay language. He also led the development of Spectre RF and contributed substantially to the Velog AMS language and the AMS designer simulator. And since uh, he left Cadence, he has focused on establishing analog verification. Um, so uh, I think Ken is going to give us a, a small presentation, I, I believe. And then uh, we also have um, Pascal, who's the CTO and co-founder of Semimod, and I think he has a presentation as well, a short presentation. And we also have uh, Alessandro, uh, who is a veteran uh, in IC design, and he's notable of high volume RFIC products. He's currently um, uh, uh, teaching at the University of, uh, please correct me, uh, Bologna, right? Um, and uh, he has more than 15 years as technical management experience, and he's, he was the CTO at Silicon Labs for six plus years. Um, so thank you guys for joining us, and hopefully you can discuss more about uh, uh, Verilog A and OpenVAF um, and beyond. So um, <clears throat> up to you, Ken, now if you have any. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Excellent. All right. I, sorry. I, uh, no I use Linux and that kind of creates a lot of problems. Um, I'm having, a, I'm, I needed to, uh, do it myself so that I. <clears throat> so Ken, I, I don't know if you, uh, attended, um, previous, uh, or, um, you, you reviewed some of the talks we had here, but we had, um, a focus on modeling and opening um, uh, VAF and uh, Verilog A modeling with Semimod. Uh, I, we had Marcus presenting and a couple other people uh, discussing EKV modeling. Um, so this is a little bit background to give you a little bit of background here. So um, I'm looking forward to your presentation here. Okay, so um, let me start. Let me sure. try to share my screen. Can you see uh, my yes. opening slide? Excellent. <laughs> All right, so largely what I wanted to do is just give some background information as to why I, I believe that, this is, that OpenVAF is a very important project and that should be funded. And that the whole, you know, in, in some sense kind of gives support to the whole kind of HIPS Alliance um, uh, philosophy of trying to open up um, hardware design for the for for everyone. So let me just start by saying that um, in the analog world, the whole thing kind of all of analog design rests on the idea of spice. Spice was like the first simulator was the first CAD tool created um, back in the 70s. And, and when it was first created, it was also um, arguably one of the first if not the first open source um, uh, software project uh, created. And as a result, it kind of spread widely throughout the industry and it was used as the background backbone for all of, or the foundation for all of IC design. And now you can't really do analog IC design without some kind of a circuit simulator. So it's a, it's a really foundational tool. And if you wanted to build one, there's kind of two things you need. First, you need knowledge of simulation algorithms. And this is relatively common. Lots of people have the ability to create um, the simulation side of a simulator. The other thing that's required is the device models. And they have to be, they just can't be any device models. They have to be trusted by the foundries. If you're gonna build, um, if you're gonna build a chip, you need the devices to be, the models that you're using to be the ones that are um, sanctioned by the foundry themselves. And this is where all, a lot of our problems in the analog world um, kind of stem from, is the fact that uh, the, the cost of, of creating and, and validating these models is so high that only a small number of vendors can actually afford to do it. 
And uh, a lot of the reaction in the last many years has been to try to um, kind of unlock these models so that everybody can use them. All, all the simulators can use them. Now, of course, this is not a big emphasis of the big uh, vendors, but um, for the for everyone else, this is something that's very important. And OpenVAF kind of leads us in this direction. Some time ago, maybe maybe a decade ago, um, there was an effort to extend the Verilog A modeling language so that it supported compact models. Um, and largely Verilog A was pretty suitable for what they wanted, but there was just some things missing, so they added those things in. There were also things that they didn't really need. Um, and those um, people that are focused on the compact model extensions oftentimes just neglect the part of Verilog A that's, that's not really suitable for model device models um, and just ignores that. And there was, uh, at the time, in order to kind of open things up, the, the basic philosophy of these compact model extensions is that everybody should try to publish their models, all the, at least certainly all the modern models, um, in Verilog A so that anybody could use them. This is a, this is a big contribution. This is a big idea. The, and the reason why is because writing device models in SPICE um, is a horrendous task. It's, it's, um, the models themselves are just very, very complicated. They, they end up creating these gigantic functions with endless amounts of code. Uh, you have to compile, you have to kind of, cr the models themselves have to include not only the, the equations for current and charge, but also for their derivatives. So there's a lot of common code that needs to be factored out. It has to be done very carefully, very easy for um, errors to creep in. And those um, can be very difficult to find because they don't, those errors don't necessarily cause the simulator to crash. They just cr create convergence issues. And it's like, Hard to kind of associate convergence with these issues with the with the line of code that's creating the problem. So models are this tremendously intense support burden um, for these companies that are trying to produce this. And having a kind of a standard language where you could kind of write the model once, quickly verify it in Verilog A in an interactive simulation, and then publish it. Um, really kind of a, goes to address all these a lot of these problems because the, the, the Verilog A model compilers themselves would automatically create the derivative equations. And just through, you know, just through use, when bugs are fixed, they would be fixed for everyone. And so we'd end up with a much healthier system. But that hasn't really come to pass like we had hoped. And the reason why is because the model compilers that we've created to do that were, were really not, um, not up to the task. They were incomplete, they generated inefficient code, and they really haven't kind of uh, come up with it. We haven't been able to come up with a situation where um, we've got this ecosystem where we generate Verilog A models that are just passed around um, and they get installed in all of the simulators. So the end result is there's still a substantial amount of investment required to integrate a model. And anybody that supports a simulator has to be able to afford that um, investment. Otherwise, their simulator won't be used. And which means that open source simulation is really hamstrung in this whole thing. Open source simulators, they don't really have the resources to support the models, yet alone also build the simulator. And so they're forced to kind of um, divert a lot of their resources and attention to the models and, and therefore the simulators themselves suffer. Uh, Verilog A itself has kind of two aspects to it. One is this, this focus on compact modeling. That makes it nice uh, for modeling devices like MOSFETs and such. Uh, most model compilers focus on this, which basically limits anything using a model compiler to these low-level transistor-only simulations. So they're suitable for relatively small analog IC designs. Uh, the other aspect of Verilog A that's very important is the functional modeling aspect. And this is what allows you to model circuits. And when you model circuits, then you can step up to the next level. And this present, provides um, um, the, the ability to kind of simulate larger analog systems. 
Now, model compilers are ignoring this, and because a lot of the open source simulators, they don't support Verilog A, the, the kind of the whole language, they only support um, these compact model extensions, then all of these open source simulators are kind of missing this aspect of Verilog A, which would be an important, um, an important feature for them if they had it. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the situation we're in. Verilog A itself, is has a lot to offer um, the simulator community because it's a standard language and analog simulation is kind of beset by all kinds of incompatibility issues there are incompatibilities in the models themselves but there's also incompatibilities in the netlist and the fact that verilog a is a standard language means that we can move to it as as a kind of a base of simulator development and as a net lifting language and resolve a lot of these things. So uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about um, this idea of Verilog A as the base of a simulator development. If we had a model compiler, if, if the industry had a model compiler that was strong and robust and complete with a solid API, then it would be a relatively simple matter for people to, um, to create simulators around it to just uh you know somebody could just sit down and write a simulator and base it off this uh and and pull in all their models from this model compiler and that would kind of open uh or, or kind of stem or create a lot of uh of kind of innovation in the simulation industry that's now being kind of stifled because of the fact that only the large simulation vendors can afford to really provide um, the models that, that people are willing to use. So the hope is, is that if we can kind of move to a Verilog A based um, simulator development with a really solid model compiler, the whole ecosystem will, will kind of open up for us. Okay. Um, and this brings me to OpenVAF. I'm not going to speak a lot about OpenVAF. I'm kind of new to the whole thing, but I've looked at it and I'm really quite impressed with the whole project. I think it really has a lot of potential, a potential that really has been missing um, to this point. Um, unfortunately, because of resource constraints, it's largely focused on device modeling, like the previous model compilers. There's no real emphasis on functional modeling yet. There's, they're, they're trying, but they just don't have the resources. And they, currently, they're, not, they're ignoring param sets. I haven't mentioned param sets yet, but param sets actually offer a con considerable amount of um, promise for simulation development. So let me just speak real briefly about param sets. Uh, basically, when you go to model when you go to simulate a device, you need two things. You need the model equations that describe that device, and then you need a set of model parameters for those model equations that, that kind of fit that, those equations to the actual device that you're trying to simulate. Those, those model parameters are, there can be a very, very large number of them, hundreds of model parameters to tailor the device to a particular, uh, tailor the model to a particular device. Um, and currently in Verilog, there's no mechanism for providing, for providing these parameters to the models. Um, param sets was an attempt in Verilog A to provide a mechanism in the Verilog A language to specify these parameter, model parameters. Now, that by itself seems very pedestrian, but if you actually take those two, if you, if you kind of recognize that param sets are there and the model equations are there when you're building the model compiler and you compile them together, so you grab the parameters and the equations, compile them together, then you can end up compiling out a lot of the, um, and pruning the expressions and, and making, creating, um, uh, compiled models that are much more efficient than if you, if you wait, which is kind of the traditional approach in SPICE today, is to have compiled set of equations without the parameters and then provide the parameters. Now these parameters have to be carried around in the simulation. They have to be reevaluated each time. It's, uh, there's a lot of overhead that goes along with this. A big part of that is the memory footprint. Like carrying around all these numbers just really kind of thrashes the cache. 
And so it makes it, uh, it kind of slows down the, uh, considerably slows down the, the model evaluation. So if we can kind of optimize a lot of these things out, create a, a device with a much smaller memory footprint, then um, we could have much faster simulations. Ram sets is kind of the thing that will cause that to happen. As long as param sets are really kind of um, included in the kind of core development of the, of the model compiler. So it would be great if OpenBAF could have the resources to focus on this idea of param sets. I think that would both, that would really kind of make uh, it a force in the industry and give it kind of a momentum that it wouldn't have if it were, if it were just able to kind of replicate what other simulators would. But if it could go beyond what other simulators could do as far as performance, that would really make it a force in the industry. Currently, the current situation is commer commercial simulators dominate the scene. Um, I see capable analog simulations very expensive. Um, the simulator vendors themselves are, are in it for them, their own selves. So they just wanna, in their mind, all they need to do is to, is to get a partnership with the foundry, get models that are compatible with their simulator. And as far as they're done, that, as far as they're considered they're done, that's, that's beautiful. But that just kind of leaves these other simulator vendors out, out in the, you know, struggling to get that same kind of compatibility. And it just kind of completely locks out the open source simulator. Um, in order to question? Kind of overcome this, yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, it's Rob Bain. So, uh, just curious with open source simulators, and what is the engagement level with uh, foundries? You know, for example, like TSMC. I guess I'll use that as the uh, the poster child, so to speak. But are they amenable to working on this? Because they, of course, have to devote quite a bit of uh, effort in terms of modeling. And of course, for advanced process technologies, the silicon development companies often have internal resources as well. So I'm just curious what the stance is with EDA suppliers on the, or uh, it's boundaries around this, excuse me. Yeah, so my experience in this field is dated. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of let anybody else speak if they want to, but my experience is they, they have very little, that the foundries don't interact with the open source simulator. That is correct from my experience as well, even if it is one year, one year dated. <laughs> Yeah, in general, this seems to be a, a problem, right? I mean, it's a, uh, it's, I attended a seminar on machine learning and EDA uh, a week ago, Friday, and it's the same kind of thing relative to that people are just extremely sensitive about their data, whether, you know, go into simulators or into EDA applications or into machine learning models, right? So it's kind of a, a problem across the board. So, okay, thank you. I make a quick comment. Yeah, so my yeah, I think Rob, you're, you're correct. But uh, I think the biggest problem with the foundry, not problem number one is the trust, as Ken said, right? They wanna be sure that the model that they deliver simulate correctly because if the stuff is not simulated correctly, the customer can complain and they will have to throw away wafer and maybe ask for a refund, et cetera. So the real trust is number one in terms of cost. And then the second element is what you said about um, um security or whatever you know but in that case the compilation of the model actually already can help in that direction as well so i think if the very low game model would be trusted can be trusted then it can be really, really be revolutionary in that direction in my opinion anyway that's my comment thank you yeah from my personal experience um what i found is that if you're not the one of the top simulation vendors, if you're not bringing in a lot of um, uh, revenue to the foundry, then they won't talk to you either. So even the vendors uh, don't get much access. Only only kind of the primary vendor gets a lot of that. So it's a it's a tough, it's really tough to kind of enter the simulation world. All right, so let me just kind of finish my last slide and then, uh, and then we can kind of move on to Pascal. So from my perspective, uh, OpenVAF is the first project in 25 years that, that has the foundation that's strong enough to really address these issues. And I think if given some more funding, they could um, provide uh, behavioral modeling capabilities, uh, kind of 
functional level modeling capabilities in the language, as well as this highly optimized um, models based on param sets uh, that would be powerful enough so that they could conceivably um, become basically the standard model compiler for the entire industry, not only the open source simulators, but also for the commercial simulators. I don't think the commercial simulators have a really good model compiler solution. I think they, you know, they just got good enough and then they moved on. Um, so I think that OpenVA can provide that. Um, and in the process of doing that, it can democratize analog simulation in a way that we just don't have today. And that's gonna be very important going into the future because from what I can tell, um, analog design education is withering in the United States. I don't know about the rest of the world. I, I don't have that kind of experience, but it seems like it's starting to kind of just wither away. It seems like the funding for research in the universities is drying up. Um, the prof professors are, are starting to leave the field and not being replaced. Um, and so we're gonna need to do something. If we wanna stay in the analog design game, we're gonna need to do something to kind of make, to kind of bring excitement back to the field and to make it um, easier for other people to kind of join in. And I think that open source simulators, you know, that's not everything, but it's kind of an important component to it. It means that anybody can, <clears throat> if you have an open source simulator, if you have an open source analog hardware design project like like chips like the chips alliance then that means that people can now um start to uh to to build these analogs stimulate and build these analog chips even though they don't have um you know tremendous financial resources anyway that's what i have to say i hope uh i hope that was helpful yeah that, that was great go ahead alessandro I mean, I want to I want to reiterate a little bit on the question that I see, like in the in the chat, uh, that Rob and Ken has been. First of all, I agree with Ken's opinion here. Maybe I'm a little bit biased in that direction, but for example, not for the analog tool, but for the digital tools, I've seen some document in the European Community, the European Chip Act, where they're trying to build res resilience. They are actually pushing a lot through openness in the order in the future. You know, you design let's say chip with a company, you need to be able to take the chip again with another tools company, et cetera, et cetera. So there is really a lot of push in that direction for resilience. I would say not for the analog in this model, but it is for digital design. So eventually I think it can be pushed in the direction as well. So anyway. Yep. Um... I think um, I think we have a couple comments from Kevin. Um, so Kevin, feel free to say those out loud if you want. Uh, yeah, one of the things is that there's a sort of legacy approach of like building like compact models and then tuning parameters for those for to plug into the simulator. But that's partly because everybody used a compiled simulator and that the models are compiled in. But there's no real reason to compile the models in these days. Uh, you you can just make a model directly from the the fab data you have, and you know it, the the simulator can do that for you to some extent. But optimizers and just give you a model for what what your process says it does. <laughs> There's no need to go out to somebody else and get a model and then so, not so I think a this, parameter set. I think this question was asked um, to I mean last time, but um, I'm not sure. I I remember the the answer. It, it wasn't easy to do that. It wasn't as simple as um, it sounds I think like. That's super difficult to do yeah. in reality. That's why not. Uh, really well, it, it depends if you know how to do it. I mean, one of the things is if you you kind of want to do this stuff for a particular simulator. So if you if you pick something like Zeiss and say this is my simulator, make me models for these for from this fab data for this simulator. You know, it's just a big data problem. And and then for a lot of the stuff you, you're looking at like standard, uh, you're looking at things which are circuits, which you can build and you wanna make behavioral models for blocks rather than devices a lot of the time. I mean, device level simulation is like horribly slow, uh, but you know, the block yeah, level stuff- we're talking about well analog design here. And if you have oh, yeah. small circuits, uh, you need to start with models just for the devices. Yeah, you kind yeah, of but it's yeah. it's a it's a multi-stage kind of thing though. If if you got the data for how the devices are, how the circuits actually work, you can say I'm going to make these I'm going to make the models um, 
for the devices to make these behavioral model things that have you know work out of the devices. I mean, these, use... these behavioral models you're talking about exist, and they're also implemented in Verilog A. So yeah, the yeah. discussion is actually redundant, I think. Yeah, I mean, Ken and I have been doing Verilog A for equally long, almost. <laughs> you know, so. Okay, great. Um, well, I guess, uh, you know, I, I think uh, from what I gather, I, I understand that there is a need for open PAF from uh, Eric from size. He, he mentioned the same thing. So thanks, Ken, for highlighting that. And maybe you can move to the next talk from Pascal. Um, yeah, let me just uh, share my screen uh, one moment. It's Um, can you can you see my screen now? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Then, um, yeah. So I, I've prepared a talk, you know, now about Open VAF itself. Um, I'm Pascal Kuta. I'm the primary author of Open VAF. Um, I'm kind of going to present what Open VAF can already do today because it can already do more than existing sim uh, compilers. And then kind of give you know an outlook on development where we're hopefully headed in the future. Um, for the uh, starting with the motivation, uh, Ken really provided a, a really good introduction here, so I'll just keep this brief. You know, Verilog A is already the industry standard for the distributing device models, um, is standardized by the CMC, but also has great potential for behavioral and functional modeling. Um, you know, the existing Verilog A compilers are not just up to just not up to the task. They are slow. They are hard to use, uh, especially the uh, existing open source uh, Verilog A compilers are very difficult uh, to set up. Um, you know, in, in the past, the old Verilog A uh, integration and ng spice required you to recompile the entire simulator and change the simulator source code by hand to get in a new model. So really cumbersome. And um, even worse, the models they output, the uh, Kendall really mentioned that they're in inefficient. They are two times slower than if you write them by hand. And um, they also uh, only cover a small part of the language standard. Again, as Ken mentioned, the functional part of the language standard is often neglected. And they are simulator specific. So every simulator needs to kind of go through the effort again of building their own Verilog A compiler. And that's kind of why we built OpenVF at SemiMods to address these problems. Right now, OpenVF is uh, released publicly open source under GPL license. It's integrated into uh, with ng-spice, so you can right now use it to simulate with ng-spice. And the old Verilog A support in ng-spice has been deprecated, so open, uh, and will be removed in one of the next releases. So OpenVF will be the only Verilog A integration in ng-spice. And the focus has been easy set up. So you don't need to don't do some complicated steps. You just need to download the binary from our, from our website, compile your model, and put one statement in your netlist, and you're good to go. Another focus then kind of going the same direction has been good UI. I've just put an example down here. So we've been inspired by you know traditional compilers for traditional programming languages like C. Um, by the error messages so that it's really you can tell what's going on whereas traditionally with Verilog A compilers you often didn't really have a clue what was even going wrong which simulation just didn't work and um, kind of this ease of setup has already spawned a lot of activities around ng-spice and openvf so for example Dietmar one of the maintainers of ng-spice uh, has put together a github repository with device models, which he has tested and verified with ng-spice and OpenVF. And there's quite a large list of models there that already work, including all CMC models. And um, OpenVF, I'll now get to some technical advantages as well, but really the central design point that offers OpenVF an advantage over other Verilog A compilers is that it itself works like a C compiler. So it's really, inspired by the field of compiler construction in computer science. And that allows us to achieve some, I think, really good results. So firstly, compilation speed. I mentioned before, traditional Verilog A compilers are quite slow. 
And here you can see these are just some example models. You can do the same test for most other models uh, where you see the compile time and seconds between OpenVEF, um, size ADMS and ADS inspector. These are just the compilation speeds, not simulations. And you can see it's 10 times faster across the board really, and even more in some cases. And, and you compare these in you know, OpenVF as an open source tool. Uh, and these are tools with very expensive licenses. But even more crucially, you know, you compile, well, when you compile a model, you often run simulations very, very often. And what's crucial is that these simulations are fast. And here OpenVF also has advantages. Um, now the comparison here is a bit more difficult because comparing simulation times across simulators is a bit more nuanced and challenging. So instead of comparing the simulators directly, what we've done is we've done a relative comparison. So we use the built-in model built in into the simulator as a baseline, and then the Verilog A model compiled with the very respective Verilog A compiler kind of as the benchmark. So in this case, um, we've used the BCMSOI model. It's been around for a couple of de decades been, uh, and has been around in GSPICE for a long time. It's very well optimized. And what you can see here is the co model compiled of OpenVF is only 6% slower. So only marginally slower than the you know, op model that's been optimized for decades and hundreds of human hours put into it. And in Spectre by comparison, the built-in model performs well. But the Verilog A model is 170% slower. So they do, not have, uh, they do not have this advanced optimizations that OpenVF has. Now, how do we accomplish this? Ken already alluded to, to this again. Um, you know, when you hand write a compact uh, device model into a simulator, you need to do this laborious task of hard coding all these symbolic derivatives into the simulator. And you know, it's it's labor intensive, it's cost prohibitive, extremely expensive. And I've just have one interesting data point to add here: seventy percent of the C code in NG Spice are these handwritten models, all of which could be, in theory, replaced with OpenVF eventually. And so that's really adding on what Ken said: that a, a large portion of creating a simulator is creating these models, and that's even with many modern a ton of modern CMC models is in fact still missing from ng-spice. Um, so if all of these were implemented in ng-spice as well, then the, the, the percentage would, lar would rise significantly. Um, and OpenVF is able to come this close to handwritten code and really therefore displace the need to write models by hand by using innovative algorithms to generate derivatives more or less similar to a human would because OpenVF works more like a C compiler, we have a much deeper understanding of the model source code in the in the compiler and can therefore uh, apply heuristics to more efficiently generate these derivatives. Now, of course, another factor is not just that um, OpenVF um, is fast, but you, of course, also need to be able to use it. And here again, we try to do better than existing solutions. So instead of being, you know, specific to a single single simulator and duplicating a ton of work um, by doing, you know, integration uh, complex integration with each simulator, OpenVF takes instead a more flexible approach of compiling these Verilog A models to a shared library, and this shared library has then an interface called OSDI, Open Source Device Interface. And this OSDI interface is very flexible and fairly straightforward comparatively to writing a very okay compiler to generate into these simulators. In fact, the OSDI is already integrated in GSPICE and has been designed in close cooperation with the XIS team. And therefore, will, it's all definitely also possible to integrate into XIS in the future, which has an internally very different architecture than in GSPICE. So really, OpenVF also will uh, opens up, uh, as Ken already mentioned, uh, the device models to any simulator. In fact, I've also been already had people reach out to me which have research project simulators, um, which they are now using OpenVEF um, as, as the tool um, for uh, getting the models into the compiler. So they are already research projects, they're not public, but research projects that are integrating this OCI interface into their research simulators. 
now kind of uh, as a last point kind of giving a roadmap where we are headed in the future so as ken mentioned right now for our initial release you know you have to start somewhere we started with focusing on compact modeling you can already compile all cmc industry standard models and many more um, the one thing kind of missing right now from the compact modeling perspective are noise, noise simulations which is what we're working on right now um, which we're hoping to re release this sometime this year and then you know in the long term um, we have some more ambitions because openvf is internally um, very flexible, uh, has a very robust architecture. That means it has been designed from the start with the functional modeling aspects in mind as well. So in the future, we also want to integrate the functional modeling features and behavioral models, uh, modeling features into OpenVEF so that also behavioral modeling with Redlock A becomes possible. And then even further down the line, we also want to support nested modules and as Ken mentioned, param set statements. And what these really allow you is to define, you know, a good example is the Skywater PDK. The Skywater PDK is this huge amounts of um, uh, spice net lists. Um, and essentially what these param sets allow you is to take these spice net lists and do all of it in Verilog Gay. This, you know, then again, opens up the PDK to more simulators because now every simulator that has an integration with uh, Verilog A or OSDI can now use these PDKs. If you, you know, start having more widespread use of Verilog A, then you also want better tooling for Verilog A. That means, you know, tooling we're used to from other programming languages like a formatter, an IDE, which gives you auto completions in your editor or linter. And in fact, all of these tools already have like baseline uh, small uh, implementations in uh, OpenVF. It was designed from the start to be used as an IDE. Um, it was, uh, we already have a linting framework. So we already have a couple warnings that pop up when you do something that's not technically an error, but might not be intentional. And really expanding on this, um, building a language server is what could be done down the line. And of course I've let this kind of as a last point, but, um, would also be great to you know integrate with other simulators do projects like that um and to uh, push you know the the whole open standard aspect of OSDI. um for example size integration could be a great uh, tar target in the future however as ken alluded to you know this this is really a lot of work it's been a full-time job for me for a long time and um requires you know we've invested into this but it requires funding uh, because we are, do not have the resources to uh, alone to um, push all these features. But we think that OpenVF can bring significant value add to the industry uh, and therefore hope that we might be able to find partners. Uh, thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions, anybody? Thank you, Pascal, super. Yep, that was great. Thanks. Uh, any questions? You know, I'd like to make a, an observation. And that was, there was one particular slide that Pascal presented where he showed um, the Verilog A model, like a little block diagram where the Verilog A model started on the side and then they were compiled and they got stuck in this open library, uh, the source library, not, the, not a library, um, I forget what he called it. Basically, uh, oh. it was a shared library. <clears throat> and then that could interface to all the various simulators. So once the whole param set stuff is working, the, the uh, foundries can create those shared libraries and then distribute them. And then any simulator could use them. So that would really take a, that would, that would, uh, that would basically compile the, the PDKs and so that they're not visible to the outside world, making the foundries very comfortable, but it also opens them up to all the various simulators. So I think that would be a huge step forward for, for our industry. That's in indeed a great point and something I uh, also had in mind while creating this interface. So thank you for bringing that up. All good work, Pascal. Uh, do you have some contact info you can share? Uh, sure, I will um, put my email in the chat if you're interested. And, Great, thanks. Um, thank you to reach out.
So uh, Marcus, I, I think you brought up uh, a while back um, some about this funding here with Tim. So I don't know what the levels of funding you're looking for. I, I don't remember they were that big, right? So I mean, the still... funding we were discussing back then was for the MOSFET extraction for the um, Skywater PDK, but that mm -hmm. somehow got stuck. I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, the open valve, we never made a number, but. So I think that's something you should do, right? And maybe uh, send out an email where we have something we can base on uh, to get you funding. So I discussed with Eric, but there's some US versus Europe type of, uh, you know, <laughs> funding limitations, but I yeah, think but there's other people who can fund your work. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess we will write another email to Tim. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, well, uh, send it to me as well. I can I can try to uh, help. Of course, with you and CC. Yeah. I mean, we the, the state is, so I can give some background, uh, Semimod sells modeling service to industry. So now we can use this compiler together with NGSpice to run our simulations without needing to buy licenses for Cadence. And so now we can do everything we wanted this tool to do, but we see so much potential and we really don't have the resources to go further. And I would be super happy if we can go further because sure. it's a really, like it can help everybody, I think. No, definitely. I, I think one thing I, I we need to explore is uh, how to get you funding to, um, you know, agencies. And I think that the affiliation, you might need to have an affiliation in the US to, to, to do that. So maybe you should take that offline and um, okay. discuss it. Any comments or questions for Pascal? I, I think uh, the the Veral Gay compiler opened up a lot more opportunities than just doing the, the device modeling stuff. There, there's a whole bunch of stuff I was doing at IEEE on uh, uh, defect analysis, which could, could use it. That would actually be something you could build product with. Yeah, definitely. There's, I think, a lot of opportunity also for like special, specially adjusting comp models to specific, um, uh, like special purposes. For example, for cryogenic modeling, um, mm -hmm. I, I saw some interest there as well. You know, taking a standard model and then changing it in some way. Um, I think there's a lot of really a lot of room that for exploration there that um, hasn't been fully explored because it is so hard to get stuff into simulators right now both behavioral and compact models. Yeah, one big example is RTS noise, which get done in Verilog A at micro level, interpreted and make the simulation super slow. Not the one over F, the RTS for time domain simulation. So I want to ask Ken maybe a question. Um, maybe you cannot answer it um, because of uh, keeping stuff secret, but what solution does Spectra use for Verilog A? Sorry, say that again. Um, what solution does Spectra use uh, internally for Verilog A? Is it also ADMS based? No, they, they built their own. <clears throat> okay. I well, think I'm they're nearly the only ones there, though. I think it's mostly ADMS and Spectre has its own thing. And now OpenVF. So how do you see, guys, how do you see the this OpenVF uh, integrated in an open source community? Would it be, would you see size as the option or as a plugin, as I saw in the chat with uh, ng-spice? Um, like, so, so it's already integrated with um, ng-spice, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it could definitely be, like like I said, we already had some contact with Xyz. So it could definitely be integrated with Xyz too. So we, like we're hoping actually, it's... That yeah. would be the next like thing we should go for if we get some funding, integration with Xyz. Yeah, that would be really great, yeah. I personally yeah. would like to see the uh, open, the OSDI interface. Uh, well documented and published and made available so that people could create their own simulators. Have you found it? It's actually on our website. Yeah, it's like uh, I have documented 
documentation can of course always be improved, but uh, there is like a 50 page PDF or something. Um, so, so we already have quite a bit of documentation. And in fact, like I said, a researcher re reached out to me that he's using this document and has a working prototype. So it can be used to, 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 uh, to integrate into simulators. Um, Excellent. I will put the link to our website so that it's in the- uh, I already put the, it in the chat. Can be, <laughs> Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, right. Hey, Jason, I, I, I guess you're from the XICE team, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I figured I should, I should pop, pop up <laughs> and <laughs> comment <laughs> since XICE has been mentioned a few times. In fact, I was having a kind of side conversation with Aditya, who's also on our team, um, and uh, kind of lamenting that. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, we, we have some solid funding internally, but, you know, we have lots of internal priorities that have been pushing things and that we, you know, this kind of the development side just keeps sliding and sliding and it, it, it has become a source of anxiety for me that we keep, it just keeps uh, pushing forward. So, um, you know, I, you know, we, I, I really feel like we want to start pushing this though. And it makes it hard as I think Eric has mentioned too, that um, you know, we, we, we are very hamstrung in terms of what we can do with our funding and in terms of uh, um, interactions with uh, outside groups, you know, Zeiss is released open source, but you know, we don't have quite the, um, it, it's very hard for us to accept external contributions into the code. There's lots of impediments to that because uh, due to certain internal drivers. Um, so, uh, you, know, I, you know, just because we've, it's kind of been quiet on our front, I guess, doesn't mean the interest isn't there. And that, um, uh, you know, we, you know we, we are very driven to do this and, uh, you know, maybe, um, you know, it, like I said, you know, having this exchange with Aditya, maybe we can change some of our, uh, where people are focused a little bit. But anyway, that, that was the comment, I guess. I, I would say with Zeiss, it's, uh, architecturally, it's like the spice simulators where it's just a big lump of code. <laughs> and I tried doing some stuff with it and it would be good if it had more of the GNU cap, everything's a plug-in approach. You know, if you got a <laughs> yeah, it, Generic plug-in thing uh, would would help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, that, yeah, that could be uh, you know a two-hour conversation of how Zeiss ended up where it is in terms of the way the code is. But yeah. that's uh, you know lot, lots of history there. But yes, I, I you know there's lots of agreement that uh, it would be nice if it were more modular. And you know there's there's push in that direction as well. But of course, you know when you have a you know twenty-year-old legacy code, it, you know, there's lots of uh, inertia with the current design. I'm not sure how old the code is. Any... <laughs> yeah, yeah, NG spices. <laughs> I think we have a question from Jason, that. Yeah, the um, this is awesome work, uh, most importantly. The on the topic of what's next, um, I know that the last handful of popular models to be introduced have been sort of natively in Verilog A. Uh, BSIM CMG is a prominent example. How about the state of like porting some of those previously C designed ones into it uh, so that there is like a comprehensible but also agreed upon um, version of them? Is that stuff that has already happened or you guys are doing or expect someone else will be? Well, if this uh... Question is for us at Semimod. So the models we uh, extract are always CMC models where you have a very log A code. Um, for some of the really old BSA models, there are like very log A files sent by emails uh, that are not official. I have, for example, a BSIM 4, or there's another model from uh, Keysight for indium phosphide HPTs. But I uh, know we're not actively working on that. I think it might be nice to have it. But the funding for these modeling activities is really not where it should be, in my opinion. Mm. So that's not going to happen fast. But just one <laughs> thing, uh, the BSIM-4 is, I think, like the most widely used model that doesn't have an official Verilog A. And I think there are quite a few um, 
Daylog A models out there, uh, which match the, the built-in models. Um, yeah, but but the point is, many very old libraries have models that have no CMC, like no Verilog A code attached to them. That's true, from the time before Verilog A was used. Mm. And yeah, that's that's just unfortunate. We we have no solution. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't suggesting to like go back to the beginning of time or anything, but obviously the pace at which new sort of families of these um, I mean, drop is is reduced, and it's a good point that. Beast and four is probably like the last native C one, and yes. Also, but for example, honestly, among the most painful. A. Beast and four we have, but I don't know if it's perfect. I got it some time ago per email from somebody. I forgot. Uh, just, just real quick, since uh, Sandy is a member of the uh, of the CMC, I have a little. Just, you know, I, I occasionally get insight on things, but just, just a comment. It actually came up. Uh, in a recent meeting about, you know, would it be worth trying to port the BSIM-4 to uh, Verilog A? And basically the answer was, well, you know, from the developer side, you know, if you want to spend the money on that, you know, it's possible, but, um, you know, it's considered a legacy model. It's uh, pretty much, they want everybody to stop using it and move to uh, be some bulk or you know, one of these the more modern ones. So I don't think that there's much motivation on ever porting be some four because they just want to you know kind of be done with that anyway in terms of looking toward the future. So hey Jason, I think quick question. So mm -hmm. some of the open source community is based on a little bit older technologies. Like for example, now we yeah. have Skyworks, uh, Skywater, and then Global Foundries. So this model has been measured, mm -hmm. extracted using older models, right? So eventually yeah. when they come in, I don't think those foundry, you know, will probably recharacterize their technology using like a different model they already done. So aren't we mm -hmm. a little bit kind of in the corner and we need to kind of develop all the models so we are ready for this technology when they get released. Point. Yep, Agreed. that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. yeah so um, I think we are about an hour now, but um, uh, I, I'd like to catch up with you, Marcus, if you have some time uh, after this meeting. And uh, next week we'll have a discussion about PEX extraction from Magic. Uh, some of my students were working on. Uh, uh, a tape out in GF180, and you just noticed that, you know, the extracted results are completely off compared to closed tools. And I think that's a good time to discuss with um, with uh, Magic, which is the only tool to use for extraction right now, PEX extraction in open source community and see um, what are potentially the, the work that can be done there or what are the possible tools that we could, could use in addition to magic. Um, so if anyone has any comments or um, any suggestion, please reach out and we can arrange that. But uh, yeah, thanks Ken. Uh, thanks so much for attending and Pascal, really nice talk. And um, hopefully uh, we'll get some funding for our semi mod. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.